Welcome to Ali Fitness Podcast, a weekly production all about bringing health into fitness. Alexander Bauer was infected by the cycling virus back in 1986 by the Battle of Le Monde and Inno. He went on to race at all different levels, juniors, pro and masters, and had numerous achievements, including state, European and world champion titles during this time. So in 2005, he started his own business designing high-performance cycling clothing, which led to designing skin suits and aero gear for Team High Road. National federations, pro teams and individual riders have also leveraged Alex's expertise in aerodynamics and high-performance consulting. So if that wasn't enough, he also became an expert in SRM power meters and supported more than 30 world, two Olympic and more than 15 national champions to earn gold, silver and bronze medals in both road and track cycling. Alex has worked for Team Canyon SRAM as their performance optimizer since 2011 and last year he also worked with Team Sky. Today, Alex is consulting Ratha, I believe, on performance wear. So, Alex, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for inviting me. Wow, it's just such an amazing amount of things that you've done in cycling and your passion absolutely shines through. Alex, (laughs) where do we start? I guess take us through the journey as a cyclist and your longevity in the sport. Yeah, um, I started back in 1986. Since then, I was just racing as an amateur and as my hobby. And then I was working um, as a logistic project manager all over the world and then try to squeeze the cycling in between. When I decided to start my own company for clothing, Team High Road was just around the corner in the next village or city, which is Bonn. They had the service course there just met Bob Stapleton and I knew Tony Martin when he was really, really young, when he just started his cycling career. And I just asked them if I could be of help designing skin suits or better skin suits than they were available at this time. Yeah, in a cooperation with a wind tunnel engineer in England, we designed the first skin suit and Tony Martin won the Tour de France uh, time trial. And then in 2011, he became world champion. This was the first world champion in our skin suit. And since then, I think every year we have a world champion, female or male, in our skin suit, in time trial, and then later on road racing. So this is how it started. Right. And obviously, you were, by that time, say 2005, you were quite an amazing cyclist. How did you get into cycling i mean first of all how did you get in as a junior and and then how did you sort of excel all the way through to pro level so i'm originally from austria and my uncle he was doing cycling so he did not race but they were doing cycling as recreational sports he brought me after to a crit i think it might be back in 1984 I really remember it clearly in Graz, I think the second biggest city in Austria. There was a criterium and, you know, with all these very famous pros at this time, I was in a corner and I saw a crash and the Polish rider, he crashed. I mean, he really, really seriously crashed. Not like he just slipped away. He really seriously crashed and he was bleeding all over his body because he was really sliding over the street and then he hit the side wall. And then everyone was thinking like, oh, he must be dead. His coach ran to him and just gave him two new wheels because his wheels were broken and just set him back on the bike and pushed him. And he was bleeding. I mean, he was seriously hurt. Hmm. And he was just pushing him on the bike and just go, 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 go. This was so amazing. I mean, at this time, I was like maybe 14, 15, 16 years old. So and this guy chased the field and then he caught the field and then Okay, nowadays I would say they let him do it, but he just went through the through the pack at the front and then out on the front and he was bleeding on the bike. I mean, his blood was really dropping on the street. You could see it. And the crowd went just crazy. And this moment I said, wow, I wanted to do this. <laughs> so this is how my cycling started. Not like crashing it, but I wanted to be, you know, like, like him, like not giving up and giving my best and entertaining the crowd, but it's like entertaining the crowd. And also the crowd, which they gave back to him, this was the moment I decided, so I need to be a cyclist. (laughs) 
I thought you were going to say quite the opposite, that that was when you decided that's a crazy sport. Why would I possibly entertain such a thought? Quite the opposite. That's an interesting story. And so obviously from there you became a professional and the 90s were a contentious period in the sport of cycling. Mm. What, What was it like to perform as a pro during this time? It was like... Yeah, super hard, and it was really difficult. I mean, I was in a in a small uh, German team, and I just remember, you know, at this time, I think I started. I cannot say I raced. I started at fifteen UCI level races, and I just finished one. So I thought, oh, maybe you're not really not good enough as a pro. But the thing was like, you know, sometimes we just started a race. And then one time the commissioner came and said, hey, you're out of time. And I said, yeah, but can't be. We are just racing like one hour. Yeah, but the others are like 10 minutes ahead. And I said, how can I lose 10 minutes in one hour? That's almost impossible. We had a like 45 average and I lost 10 minutes. How is this is possible? And from this time, I was just the last guy in the team. I mean, like seriously, if we had a tour or a stage race, they brought me to the stage race to be sure that uh, after the second or third day, they had another soigneur or caretaker or uh, mechanic. I wasn't really, was definitely not good, but it was also because the others were dealing differently. So did you feel quite alone at that time then, or were there other people like you who just couldn't perform the impossible? When I turned pro, I was at the end of my 20s, I think at 28 or 29. So, and the years before, I was working in the business, in the economy. Like, I was the oldest, was 28, and the others were just 19, 20, 21. They were full of dreams. I was already arrived in reality. I earned my own money. I worked as a branch manager, so I had responsibility for many employees. And then I turned pro because it was a dream. It's a dream from of every cyclist, I think, hopefully. When they were desperate and starting weird things, which I did back in the 90s, I think I was old enough to realize that it's not my way. Then you feel alone in terms of these young guys should not do what they're doing now. It's like I wasn't too young to do this as, as well. And so do you feel that your dream was slightly shattered by this? How did it actually make you feel? You know, I had to quit. I decided to quit after one and a half years because I found out, like, that's not what I wanted. This is the business. That's not the business I wanted to do. So I quit the professional after one and a half years. Then I went back into working and back into amateur level. It was a dream and I did it. It's absolutely perfect. It happened at this time. So... I just have to deal with it. But it seems that you haven't lost the passion for cycling and quite the opposite. It seems like you, you're you still living the dream. <laughs> you're, you're making a massive difference in cycling. So tell us a bit about how you got into the cycling wear. Was that a previous job of yours? Was it in the clothing industry? No. In fact, it was like after I quit the pro racing, our sponsor was a cycling clothing sponsor. And he asked me because um, my former profession was uh, also a graphic artist and he was looking for a graphic artist. So he asked me if I could work for him. I just went from logistic business into cycling business. And then one of my best friends, he was also pro and it was also a good one. I would say a clean one. And he showed me that there is a different kind of way to perform very good in cycling without using PEDs. I start working with him to find out like, how can we have a clean performance? This is how it developed from this point on. I think it was early 2000s, maybe something like this. Yeah. So Alex, how much difference can cycling wear really make to performance? Huge difference. I mean, like the biggest, you just have to Imagine that sitting on the bike, there are resistance to overcome, mainly the wind resistance or air resistance. This is the main resistance you have to overcome in terms of speed. And then just imagine if you see a cyclist from the front, how much do you see from the bike and how much do you see from the body? And the body is like the object on the bike, so it's you. 
And in terms of drag resistance, it's like the bike is approximately one third and two third is the body. And the body is either covered with skin or with any kind of fabric or a helmet, at least, and some shoes. And this is the surface. And the surface decides how drag is produced or how much drag is produced. Of course, it's super necessary to have the best bike, the best bike in terms of slicky to the wind, fast wheels, fast tires. That's very others drag causing resistances like mechanical drag or rolling resistant. But the body is like 65%, 70% is caused by the body. And you have to cover the body with the correct fabric. And then you can beat the air resistance a lot. And can you give me some sort of, I guess, maybe statistics on examples that you've had previously, maybe even with your your best friend and how you got into it? What sort of differences did you see with the the clothing? Yeah, so just imagine a professional, if we take like Tony Martin as an example, as a time trial world champion, if he's pushing like 400 watts over an hour to create 50 kilometers per hour average which is pretty normal. Then like a skin suit can make, if you have a really bad one, this one can cause like 30, 35, 40 watts drag, which is almost 10%. And if you have a really good one, good skin suit, you may have an advantage up to 15, 20% watts, which is like 5%. Does not sound so much, 20 watts, just in terms of calculation. It's like when Bradley Wiggins won the Olympic time trial 2012 in London, he won by a margin of like 50 something seconds, like 52, 55 seconds over Tony Martin as a second on distance of approximately one hour. So you can do a calculation that approximately he won by like nine to 10 watts advantage. Hmm. You know, it sounds super much like, yeah, he won by 55 seconds. But when you do the calculation, it's not more than like 10 watts difference. So it's like Tony Martin may have pushed 10 watts less or more because he was behind. Or maybe Bradley Wiggins had just a little bit better tires or his skin suit was a little bit better or his position, of course, was a little bit better. But it's just like 9 to 10 watts. And if you then imagine that you can have a skin suit, which makes a difference, like the worst one, like 30 watts, and the best one, you gain like 20 watts, then 10 watts, a gold medal or a silver medal is decided by half a skin suit. So this is why that's super important. Mm, It's definitely the difference then between winning and coming second. Or winning and coming like 10th, just because you have a good and a not good skin suit. Geez. So obviously you're a big believer in wearing most aerodynamic clothing, but what about other factors? You just mentioned tires and position on the bike. What other factors and, and how would you even rank them in terms of the most efficient aerodynamic choice? As I said, there are many drag causing resistances on the bike. We have a mechanical resistance, so like the drivetrain the front and rear derailleur, the chain, the chain rings and all this. You can pimp it with uh, ceramic bearings and ceramic chains, special treated. This is costs tons of money. You have to spend approximately like 300 euros per one watt. So to gain one watt, you have to spend like 300 euros on the chain. Hmm. And then you gain maybe one and a half watts only. You have like tires, a good tire. The tire is the only contact you have to the road. Some people do not really pay the biggest attention to the tires, but in fact, the tire decides how you are on the road. And that's the only thing. A good and a bad tire, this is way different. I mean, just imagine in Sydney, there is not so many snow on the road in winter, (laughs) but Hmm. just imagine you have winter tires and summer tires. If you go in summer with a winter tire, you need more gasoline per hour or per 100 kilometers. And this is the same on the bike. Just imagine some of the tires, there are like winter tires. They have a rolling resistant like crap. So so surely tires must be one of the most important influences then factors. No, it's it's a package. 
it's really a package. You can pick one, but at the end, it sums up to everything. And then you have, of course, the position. This is because it's the object. You form the object, so your body, on the bike. There are so many crucial things which are just unbelievable. It's just how you hold your thumbs or your fingers, how you open them in the front. Just imagine if you see a cyclist from the front. Take any picture you find on the internet from the front. What you see is what the wind sees. Mm. And if you do not see so many from the object or from the bike, so like a wide handlebar, or you have the hands wide open because you have a wide handlebar, so you just open the chest. Just imagine you push down your head and you bring your arms together. You decrease your frontal area, which is supposed to the wind, the faster you are. And this, you can play like any small detail, just to a cable. This is why we now have like, may I mention some companies? Absolutely. Like SRAM ETAP, for example, they have a wireless shifting system. So they have no wires. If you have a wire and you have a real good uh, time trial frame, it will be inside the frame so that it's not exposed to the wind. And then, for example, the SRAM, they have a wireless because this a small wire, just a shifting cable, can make a huge difference in terms of drag. So you can play it down to the smallest thing you want. You even screw out your valves that they are not going out of the rim. Or the, like the, I don't know, handlebar tape. You take off the handlebar tape from the bar ends because you do not need it for sweating or something like this because it's just a one-hour competition. And if you take off the handlebar, you may be safe to what? It's amazing. It's a really, yeah, it's super amazing, yeah. It is. I wish uh, a two watts or, or even five or even ten would make a difference in my cycling, but unfortunately it probably wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I use the ETAP that you're talking about, but I don't get that advantage, I'm sure. <laughs> so an interesting thing that happened in cycling was power meters. Mm. And I know you were one of the first to work with power meters and before most people even knew what they were, you were using them. Can you let us know how how you use them, I guess, and how the use of power meters has changed over the time? Yeah. Frankly, I think we started using it back in uh, 1996, 98, something like this, and I had no clue what it was. I think no one had it except the founder of the first one, like Uli Shovra from SRN. I think he had a clue what it might be, but the other one not. They were just looking on numbers, and these numbers were jumping up and down, and uh, no one could even tell what it means. Like, yeah, 480 watts feels like burning in the legs, and 200 watts is hmm, yeah easy, but at these days, no one could really tell. And then we start doing with track testing on the track in Bütgen. Bütgen is really near to uh, Dusseldorf, where the uh, Grand Depart of the Tour de France is in uh, three weeks or in two weeks. There, I got a clue what a power meter really is. So in fact, it's measuring your performance immediately from your legs. There is nothing in between. You just push the pedal and then you have the crank, and inside the crank, there are strain gorges, and they measure how much you bend the crank. And this is transferred into Newton meters and into how many watts you are pushing. And then still, yeah, still you don't know how much is 250 watts, 150 watts, 400 watts, how, how much is this? And then later on, when you start training with it, you start getting a clue like how much energy do you burn because any what you produce burns energy and energy you burn is uh, you spend. And then like if you want to lose weight, it's easy to say, ah, I went out for a three hour ride. Okay, what did you do? You were just cruising around or you were hard pushing the pedals. But what is hard and how much energy did you burn? So can you afford to eat the pizza afterwards or better not? Even you were just out for three hours. Suddenly, you had a tool which tells them what is your effort worth. It's not only losing the weight, but this is just one thing because you burn energy. On the other side, it's like you got a clue. Suddenly, like they drop me uphill. Every time in the race, they drop me on the uphill. I don't know why. Okay, now we can measure it. You measure how much you were able to push. Like you were pushing 300 watts and you were dropping. So you, you have a clue like, okay. 
I need to push 350 watts, but how can I do it? And then you go back to the sports scientists and they, or to the coach, and they tell you, okay, if you do these and these intervals with this and this performance, you may be able to push these 350 watts in three, four, six weeks. So you had a clue what to train and how much your performance is um, clearly worth. And so was there much knowledge back then when it first came out about FTP or anything like that, or were you just basically using it just to see how much energy was being expended? Yeah, I think it started with the energy expended. But um, this FTP, yeah, we had these terms, but mainly you go like, we do some base miles. The most difference came not with the FTP, the most difference came with the base miles. We do endurance or we do base miles in winter, we do build up period and then suddenly it came up like in winter people start using these power meters they know what they do and then suddenly in winter it was really cold outside or it was not a nice day and everyone was just cruising around any certain speed and suddenly these guys with the power meters showed up and say yeah but we need to do like 30 average in winter 30 kilometers per hour yeah but why why so fast so the the old school people showed up and said no, 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 that's way too fast for base miles. And then the power meter guys came and said, yeah, but you see, I need to push this certain amount of watts, like 180 or 200 watts. I need to push it to train my muscles, and not correct, but in the best way for me to build up my FTP, even in winter. I think this was the biggest break from the old school to the new school thinking. Like base miles or endurance miles, you just go slow and long. The longer, the better. And then suddenly the power meter guys showed up and said, yeah, you see, but if you do five hours in winter at like four degrees and you do five hours in, at your speed, which is maybe like 120 watts, this is what they said. And then you see, you burn like 2,000 calories in five hours. But if I go in three hours and I burn 2,000 calories, it's the same worth to my body. I do the same development as you is doing in five hours, but I'm only spending three hours in the cold environment and the rest, I go back and sit on my couch. You are still on the road. And if you do it every day and every week and after three months, maybe you get a cold and me not. Or I recover faster because I was just three hours on the bike and you were five hours on the bike. So it changed in terms of I wouldn't call it you do less training, but you do a way smarter training, way smarter. Mm. And did you use power then also for recovery? So what I mean yeah. by that is did you use the power meter to measure how hard you were working and therefore knew when to recover? Yeah, for sure. Because like people say, you just have to take a recovery shake or you have to eat healthy after the training. It always depends what did you do before. So if, for example, if you feel you did hard intervals and without a power meter, it's just your feeling. If you do a spinning class, so you do one hour, full gas, it's a closed environment, so it's inside a room, it's quite hot, or maybe it's air conditioned, but normally it's a little bit hot, everyone is sweating. So and afterwards, you really have the impression in your body or the feeling, wow, I did a super hard exercise. But in fact, what did you do? You're heating up your body, you were sweating a lot, and you just burned maybe tons of carbohydrates. But what do you do afterwards? Do you really need to refuel everything and with tons of pasta, maybe, or with lots of energy drinks? Because you burned a lot of energy, so you refuel it. And then with the power meter, you can tell how much this effort was really on your body. You were still sweating the same, it was still hot, and you still have the same burning in your legs. But you can tell afterwards, like, oh, in this one hour, I just burned, like, if you had 250 average, it's just 100 uh, kilocalories. This is not so much. So you better do not eat the pizza afterwards. Mm. You can rate your performance and then also what I'm going to do afterwards for recovery. Mm, Interesting that you're using the pizza analogy there. And I guess... I'm very interested to know from a professional cycling experience, you spend a lot of time working with professional cyclists and Mm. how much importance do you feel is placed on their 
say, long-term health versus their short-term performance? Very much. These professional cyclists, normally they start really on a young age, like 14, 12, 14, 15, 16. And then when they were able to turn pro, they need to decide in which discipline. So from telling from their body shape, like if you are not at all, so if you're a small person and if you are slim, they always maybe decide you to go as a mountain climber. On the other side, if you are have you have lots of muscles or if you are a really strong guy, you go for a maybe track or you go for road sprinting. And sometimes I think the sprinters, they do not have a health problem because they can eat what they want in terms of if it's still healthy and good food. The biggest problem is what the mountain climbers have. They rate everything on a watt per kilo uphill. So the less kilos you have, the what you push, they are more worth. I think there are still people in the cycling or coaches, very old one. They always say like, yeah, 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 you have to get up from the dinner table and you have to be still hungry. So you never eat that much that you are not hungry anymore, which is not really healthy. So you are always like in a starving mode, especially for women. This is not very healthy. But this is how they thinking. I mean, like the normal society, the impression is that women have to be slim or they have to be fit, but not with many weight. And in cycling, it's even worse. Mm. So and I who, think. Who do you think drives that, Alex, in cycling? So, say with a professional team, will there be quite a lot of pressure from coaches, or is it even further above than that? You're self driven when you enter this business because you get the impression or you get the the experience so huh, they drop me on the climb if i lose another kilo maybe i can stick with the pack and if i lose another kilo maybe i go on the front if i lose another kilo maybe i can attack on the front mm. this is what you learn the simplest way why they drop me yeah because you are too heavy maybe your bike is too heavy okay you get a lighter bike i still drop me ah you have to lose weight you know if you talk to a cyclist just talk to a cyclist after winter Everyone at the first races will tell you like, nah, I still have one, two kilos too much, which is ridiculous. Who cares? If you do a crit, for example, who cares if you have one or two kilos too much? This is our society at the moment. But in cycling, it's even more obvious. You drop on the climb because you are too heavy, so you have to lose weight. So and then it depends on what kind of people are surrounding you, like friends, family, team members. Then it depends like how they are dealing with this. And then suddenly, if you have like coach or team manager, like with their mind still back in the 90s, yeah, you have to train for eight hours. You do not eat so much. You have to ride hungry in a starving mode. You have to go out training with no breakfast, something like this. Or you have to go out for a five hour ride and afterwards you just get some vegetables or two apples. Hmm. Maybe so this is, especially for women, it's even more unhealthy than for men, but this is how it still is. So in summary then, fitness and health, obviously mm. they're quite fit people that you're talking about. How healthy are they? I think there is change happening because they, in the past, there were people super skinny and they thought because they are skinny, they are fit. They are just skinny with no muscles. And I think it changed over the last maybe three, four, five years. You can see that they are still skinny, but they are looking more healthy. The skin is more healthy. The total mood is different. And they have muscles. Muscles in terms of not really defined muscles you can see through the skin. But you can see like, for example, if they do squats, they develop a butt for sure because you need these muscles. And like 10 years ago, or what you can see, like, I don't know if you have it in Australia, Australia's next top model, or Germany's next top <laughs> model, America's next top model. These girls, they are just 14, 16, 18. They are just skinny. This is the industry from the fashion. You just have to be skinny, like 170 tall, 50 kilos, or maybe less. That's nice. That's good. That's fine. No, that's not. And I think this changed over the time. So that these girls do not have maybe like 170 tall and 50. They have maybe 55 kilos, but they, they have a body. They look like females and not like skeletons 
covered with skin. This changed over the time also with this healthy food stuff, like people posting pictures from their food on Instagram. In the past, never happened, but now it happened. And they're posting not like, like fries, Coke, beer, but they're posting really healthy food. And also the superfood, which came up, however you call it, superfood, whatever. But if they have chaya seeds, amaranth, or whatever, that is, you do not have to export things from middle America and bring them to Europe. I think there is a different kind of understanding how food should be and how healthy it's for you. That it's not like, yeah, any kind of junk food. Or people now, I think people now better can rate what is junk food and not. I mean, mm. not if you use any fast food restaurants, sometimes it can be helpful. Like if you have a burger with lots of beef, if you start it with this, this is not really unhealthy. If you do a barbecue and you prepare your own burger, I mean, that's not unhealthy food. If you add all these sauces and if you add all these soft drinks and if you add all these French fries, then it becomes really unhealthy. But in terms of like the beef itself, it's not that unhealthy. Mm. There's a way bigger awareness what kind of food is good for your body, so healthy, and what, what is not good. Mm. And Alex, presumably the professional teams such as Team Canyon and Team Sky and all of those teams have their mm. their own nutritionist and education mm. around nutrition. Would I be right in guessing that? Yeah, sure, definitely, definitely. So for Team Sky, for example, they have their own chef. It's not because the, the food in the hotel you get is not that good. But in terms of like, they really pay a lot of attention to recovery right after the race and then the right recovery, not like any recovery drink or powder or whatever you can get from any supplier. It's like they mix it themselves together. Like this is good. This is good. This is when we need in the first 30 minutes. This we need in the, in the first two hours. They compose it together. And the same is what um, Kenyan Ram is doing. They also try to educate, or we try to educate the riders to a more healthy living style. In the past five, six, seven years ago, the girls afterwards, they just ate some like two apples or they had like half a liter of water. This is my recovery. Now they are aware of like you need proteins to rebuild the muscles right after the race. You need carbohydrates. To refuel the muscles it will not make you fat. Protein will not build massive muscles on your body. It just helps your immune system and it helps to rebuild the muscles you need for the next day, for the next stage, for the next race. So there is a way, way bigger awareness how important this is to have a chef. And we always cook in the camper. We have meals ready right after the race or when the girls have to go to the airport, they get some food. Healthy, good food, lots of vegetables, fruits, uh, like rice for carbs, chicken for proteins, and then they get this package and then they go to the airport so they have something good to eat. They are not sending, like maybe in the past, some years ago, they were just sent to the airport and then at the airport they are fully hungry after the race, so they just jump into the next fast food restaurant, get something to eat or have a sandwich on the plane, which is of course not enough. Then arrive late at night at home, up from the early morning, did a, did a race. And then at home, maybe no one is there to cook something uh, really good. So they get either a cold pizza or maybe they get some pretzels lying around, something like this. So, and this is what now the awareness is that you need to stop this because the next race will be influenced by this. So we prepare them a real good food they can have on the way when they travel. And also when they come to the race, we're going to tell them, see, you better eat this and that. You just need to refuel. And for example, they, they do not drink soft drinks. They drink water because they know water is way better for the body than any kind of soft drink. This is what happened like maybe in the last four, five, six years. Great. So it sounds like things are changing. Yeah, definitely things are changing. Excellent. And look, before we let you go, Alex, can you share mm. with us I guess your thoughts on where cycling, professional cycling, might go from here in terms of performance, health, and fitness? There was a really nice quote back in uh, 2006. There was the German sports minister when Jan Ulrich was 
I mean, he was never tested positive, but when he had his end of career because of weird things. <laughs> so this, yeah, the sports minister said, your life after cycling is way longer than your life in cycling. And this is definitely true. I mean, in 2006, everyone thought like, yeah, mm, he's a German superstar and he won the Tour de France. And, mm, and for sure, he spent like, starting from 10, 12, 13 years on cycling, and he finished with 28 years. So maybe he was like 15 years in cycling. Now it's 10 years ago or 11 years ago. And in five years, he's just, how old is he now? I think he t just turned 40. In 25 years, he will be still living out of cycling. I think the riders and also the, the team managers and all these swan years, I think the awareness how healthy the living inside the cycling must be is way better. And I think it's not like, yeah, that's our employee and he's a talent and he has to be successful in a very short period so that he can earn a lot of money, we can earn a lot of money. And then after five years, he's just burned out and we take the next rider or the next talent. Um, these days, it's way, way different. So that people think like long-term, it's hard to calculate long term because everything is really short term. Everyone needs to make really good profit in a very short time because you never know what will happen in three or four or five years. But I think nowadays, the teams I'm working with, they are always on long term basis. They try to educate the riders. Really, we just did it on a long term basis to have the riders develop really for a healthy living because Maybe they are not that successful in the next two years, but maybe they are successful over the next eight years. Well, that's very, so, um, that's very reassuring, that longevity approach that they're now taking. It's great to hear. Alex, I'm conscious of your time. And before uh, I let you go, I would love to ask you a question that we ask all our guests on the podcast. Do hmm. you have a tattoo? No, no. I have, uh, we call it road tattoos. <laughs> we've got many of those plenty. right i have plenty and plenty of scars <laughs> that's my tattoos now <laughs> and is, is it because you've got no room on your body after all the road tattoos that you've collected <laughs> no when i was younger i was thinking of it but then i crashed i wouldn't say i crashed a lot but of course you crash and i always thought like oh if i take this position if i take a tattoo here i will destroy it maybe so i'm um, take it here oh no there's no good position because they also have no scars no, but I also, I wear no rings. I have no watch. I have no decoration. No, it's just like... Mm. Is it because it makes you more aerodynamic? <laughs> no, no, it's not. Oh, no, no. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time, Alex. Really appreciate you coming on and uh, thank you for your enthusiasm in the sport. Thank you, Ali. It was an absolute my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. For all the resources and show notes from today's episode, please go to www.ally.fitness. If you liked today's episode, please show your appreciation by going to iTunes, give us a five-star review and subscribe.